Welcome, my name is Dr. Warwick Bishop. I'm a cardiologist, I'm an author, and a keynote speaker. I'm CEO of the Healthy Heart Network. I'm all about trying to help people live as well as possible for as long as possible. Heart disease is huge in Australia. Every 20 minutes, someone suffers a heart attack. Most of these could probably have been avoided if only we knew what to do. This podcast is all about helping you understand blood pressure, weight, cholesterol, for better health. If you enjoy this podcast, I would be honored for a five-star review. You can share it with your family and friends. It may well save someone you love. Hi, my name is Dr. Eric Bishop and welcome to my podcast and videocast station. Thanks so much for tuning in and I hope I've got something that you find interesting and informative. What I'd like to talk about on this podcast is the annual Queensland Lipid Group meeting that was held 20th and 21st of October. I had the chance to attend and I thought I would share with you some of the discussion points and presentations because quite frankly I found it really interesting. So the meeting kicked off on Friday night we had a presentation by Professor Derek Connolly, and uh, he is a consultant cardiologist at the Birmingham City Hospital. He's got a huge footprint in research and development, has been involved with some of the largest trials that really define what we do in cardiology on a day-to-day basis. And they're trials that include anticoagulation trials, trials with lipids and interestingly Professor Connolly himself set up one of the very first interventional acute interventional angioplasty labs in the UK so he is a significant international player and on the Friday night spoke about really overcoming the inertia of cholesterol lowering and it's complicated We know that for high-risk people, lowering cholesterol is really beneficial, but most of the data, both internationally and locally, would suggest that for these high-risk people, a year or so after they've had their event, they're still not reaching what we would consider appropriate targets for their LDL cholesterol. Intertwined with that, of course, is a real... uh, difficulty with a number of people who have issues with taking medications on a regular basis and in particular the statin medications. So Professor Connolly spoke about that, he spoke about the European experience and he really touched on some of the newer agents and importantly a drug called Inclisiran which is a novel agent currently just available in Australia but not available on the PBS we're expecting that would be the case next year but this particular agent works through a protein system called PCSK9 and by working through that protein system reduces LDL cholesterol the so-called bad cholesterol by allowing a greater exposure of the LDL receptor on the liver cell. Well, I've talked about Inclisiran, I think, on other podcasts. The interesting thing is this is a novel agent which uses an RNA-based molecule. So it goes into the liver cell. It's very specific to the liver cell using a special um, receptor binder or marker for liver cells. It goes into the liver cell and then interferes with the RNA. Now, if you're not quite able to remember what RNA is, well, remember DNA, which is the blueprint of our body, what defines everything that makes us up. Well, that blueprint, that DNA, has amino acids that code different proteins. And the way that we get those proteins from the DNA is that an RNA nestles up against the DNA, takes an opposite print, if you like, of the proteins that we need, and then runs through a protein factory within the cell to generate those proteins. 
Well, if we can block the RNA, we can actually block expression, or if you like, the creation of proteins that the DNA has on its blueprint. And in this particular situation, the molecule in glycerin blocks a protein that leads to the result of a better expression of LDL receptors on the surface of the liver cell, therefore lowering LDL cholesterol levels. Now, the really cool thing about this particular molecule is it is liver specific, so it's very unlikely to get any side effects beyond. It's injected, and wait for it, here's the really cool thing. Once you had your first and second dose at about 90 days apart, then the ongoing dosing is every six months. Imagine that, rolling up to the pharmacy to collect your script, rolling up your sleeve, getting a jab in the arm, and literally having your cholesterol addressed for the next six months. Pretty amazing. Anyway, uh, as one would guess, Professor Connolly was superb in his delivery and presentation and really kicked off the meeting with a fantastic overview. The next day, we then talked about uh, the so-called bad cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, but we also talked about LP, little a, that so-called bad cholesterol, I call it, uh, very bad or nasty cholesterol. It's a bit like LDL cholesterol, but with a mischievous tail on it. And that mischievous tail means it can be associated with premature coronary artery disease. It can drive inflammation. It can even drive blood clotting. And we see it associated with wear and tear on the aortic valve. Well, Karim Kostner presented that and did an absolutely fabulous job in sharing information about LP little a with us. And I think we are going to see that more and more in the future as a target for intervention, as there are on the horizon similar small molecules like in glycerin, but targeted to the synthesis of LP little a. Watch this space. For those of you listening, though, where there is a significant family history of premature coronary artery disease, if you've not had your LP little a checked, it's probably worth a conversation. Currently in Australia, there is no Medicare rebate for it. The test is about $60 out of pocket, but you only need to do it once. It's well worthwhile, and it will certainly inform whether LP little a is a culprit or not in those high risk families. So have a think about that. In the same session, we had a brilliant talk by the effervescent and always entertaining Professor David Cahoon, who spoke about one of his passions, which is omega-3 fatty acids. And he really um, shared a heap of detail around this. We know that there's been research over the years which really points to omega-3 oils being beneficial. But what Professor Cahoon really drilled down on is the importance of the omega-3 index. He basically uh, went through a presentation that left us realizing that eating omega-3 oils is probably beneficial, but unless we know what's going on with the index, we really don't have a good idea or a good handle on exactly what's going on. In fact, one of the slides he presented gave us an inclination that one of the most significant predictors of sudden cardiac death was in fact a low omega-3 index. Well, how do you get that checked? The answer is through a blood test. And currently in Australia, there isn't a rebate for that blood testing. It does cost about $100, which is not ridiculous. Um, and it is incredibly insightful. So anyone looking to maximize their health span, looking to maximize their um, reduced risk uh, and dietary intervention when it comes to um, heart health, you may well wish to speak with your general practitioner about getting an omega-3 index. Very, very interesting. We then had a series of talks on inflammation, and these were really um, 
state-of-the-art and fascinating in many ways. We had um, a discussion about culture scene and where that fits in, particularly with a, a thing called the inflammasome, which is a, uh, a molecular uh, conglomerate which is central to the process of inflammation and interacts with some of the messengers of inflammation. And we had explained to us where some of these targets for diminishing inflammation may sit. And colchicine, which some of you may have heard of as a gout treatment, which has been around forever, seems to have a role in reducing the activation of some of the agents that are involved with that inflammasome. And Colchicine itself has in fact been shown to be beneficial in reduction of cardiovascular event thought to be through that inflammatory process. So really interesting stuff. We also had some inflammation stuff uh, shared with us by a psychiatrist who was pointing to significant uh, mental health issues having associations with diet um, and inflammation and very interesting work in that space pointing to inflammation being associated with different um, psychiatric conditions as well. I think watch this space for now. It is an interesting area. We had um, a comprehensive diet and inflammation presentation. We even had an immunologist present, present on diet and inflammation. And the long and the short of it is it's pretty complicated and there's not a lot of stuff which is absolutely robust. When, it, when we look at potential foods that could be inflammatory, it's not entirely clear that is the case. And Professor Peter Clifton, who presented the diet talk when asked what his advice would be for patients separate to inflammation, he basically said to keep calories down and keep weight down, as these were the only two things that really had significant data behind them. And the inflammation story, though interesting, is not there yet. We also had a great session on imaging, and I had the chance to present with that. I was presenting on coronary artery calcium scoring. My good friend and colleague, Christian Hamilton Craig, presenting on cardiac CT or CT coronary angiography. This was an update on both these, and one of the really striking bits of information was the realization that with imaging, we are blurring the line between primary and secondary prevention. Historically, we've always thought of primary prevention as people who haven't had an event and secondary prevention as people who have had an event. But with the benefit of in imaging, we can find people who have not had an event but have lots of plaque in their arteries. And this then raises the question, how do we treat them? Well, Matt Budoff and colleagues produced a paper where they looked at people with calcium scores of 400, and that's pretty high. They actually found that this calcium score of 400 relates in terms of risk as being very similar to someone who's already had a coronary event. So we completely blur the line there between primary and secondary prevention, and we can start to look at plaque burden as the marker of intensity and intent of therapy. So a score of 400 should be considered as a high risk feature as we would consider someone who's already had an event. This is really, really important. Anyway, we finished off the meeting with a couple of fantastic uh, case presentations uh, looking at the paleo diet and a case study with that. Uh, is alcohol a, a problem and um, patients with uh, LDL, lipoprotein little a, and triglyceride abnormalities. So a swimmingly good uh, weekend away with plenty of information. I really enjoyed sharing it with you. I hope you found some of that interesting and informative. If you've got any suggestions for future podcasts, drop us a note at info at drwarwickbishop.online. For now, though, 
Thank you again for listening. I wish you the very best. I hope you live as well as possible for as long as possible. Take care and bye for now. Join the Healthy Heart Network and become part of our growing community. If you're interested in your heart health and risk of heart attack, then join the Healthy Heart Network for only $5 as a lifetime member. This represents $55 worth of value. We offer and help people understand their present state of heart health, what their current level of risk is, and the positive steps they can take to improve their risk of heart attack in the future. Go to www.healthyheartnetwork.com.au and click the Join the Family button.